What's happening, Heather? That's bored. Sir, I need more time. We have no time. Are you going to give that order or not? Sir, please. You are too naive to see the truth. There's no bringing in born. He will defend his police officer. Listen to police officers' commands, listen to what we tell you, and just stop. The nation needs to realize that when we tell you to do something, do it. And if you're wrong, you're wrong. If you're right, then the courts will figure it out. We don't get the ticket. We enforce it. But at the end of the day, each and every member should go home safe. Sometimes the use of force is necessary. You need to comply with the police officer the way the system was meant to be. Comply with the orders of police officers. Resisting arrest is a real and dangerous crime. Nonpartisan liberty for all. It is November 1st, 2016, and we are coming to you live from Las Vegas, Nevada. Thank you for tuning in to Nonpartisan Liberty for All. We're on weeknights, Tuesday through Thursday at 7 o'clock Pacific, 10 o'clock Eastern on the Nonpartisan Liberty for All media and radio network, which now runs 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And you can listen live on Spreaker.com and NonpartisanLibertyForAll.com to the live stream. And to the archives immediately following the show on Spreaker, YouTube, Twitter, Tumblr, SoundCloud, Stitcher, and iTunes. Of course, you can listen to the uh, archives at any time, but you can listen to the newest show on the archives uh, for most of those immediately following the show. It it posts uh, up there pretty quick. Um, on nonpartisan liberty for all, we promote self ownership and the ideas of true freedom and liberty, meaning being able to do whatever you want as long as you respect the freedom of others and don't directly interfere with their freedoms, exposing government for what it is a mafia based on extortion that rules without consent by threat of force and violence. And In that, just so everybody is clear, I do consider myself anti-government and anti-police. Now, that doesn't mean I hate the people within the government. I don't really hate anybody. Hate, it has nothing to do with it. Um, What they're doing is wrong, but there's no... I don't hate... uh, the government or the police and being when I say anti-government and anti-police, what I mean is that I don't believe they should exist. Now that doesn't mean I don't believe that those people shouldn't exist. I believe that those positions should not exist. I believe in an organized society, but without rulers. So, I should actually add that to my intro to clarify to people because a lot of times, you know, it depends which show you're listening to. And and really, I try to cover a lot of different things that relate to the government because I've said this before, you never know what is going to get to somebody. If you do do a story on whatever it, it, it could be anything it might be something that might resonate with them and cause them to start questioning things and that's the ultimate goal because as i've said before i mean the truth is on mine and whoever agrees with me side which i don't hear a lot of people that agree with me to be honest And that's why I mention Larkin Rose a lot, because he's really the only person that I hear that agrees with me. Now, it's not that he heard me and agreed with me. He was doing his stuff way before me. So I I don't want to I want to make sure that's clear. Uh, I didn't I've played his stuff, but 
and I, I've learned from listening to some of his stuff, kind of expanded on some things. But in general, I had most of those ideas before listening to Larkin Rose. It just so happened that I already had those ideas. Um, but he was around way before I even had those ideas. But I didn't learn them from listening to him. Although I can say that he's helped me to think about more uh, uh, better ways to get the ideas out there because he's great at doing that. Um, he's a great speaker when it comes to talking about the government and the truth about the government and what it really is. And, you know, I've listened to everything on YouTube that he has out there that I, I could find for the most part. Uh, a lot of it's redundant because, like, when he does a speech, you know, he'll he did like a tour, and and this guy is a guy who's not getting paid. I don't think he got paid for any of it. He might have got paid for some of it, but if he did, it was like nothing. You know, it's not like he is a, you know, uh, making all this money or anything like that. They might have paid his expenses to get to wherever he was going to or something. And it, it's it's sad because if he was anybody else. If he was talking about, uh, if he was a Republican or a Democrat or a progressive or a socialist or any of those um, things, he'd probably be a millionaire. I mean, he's that good, and I don't want to sit here and and kiss his ass. Um, I only say that because I believe that. And I'm not somebody who gives a lot of props to anybody. I don't really... You know, there's stuff I like that people do. Very rarely now do I say I'm a fan of the person. Um, and even with Larkin Rose, I mean, I don't know him personally. He, uh, Mark Edge had asked him for me to come on the show during his retirement. And then it seemed like he was unretired, so he had asked again. And really... Um, I was looking for his email address cause Mark had uh, copied me on it and I was going to send him an email about playing his stuff, you know, doing like a Larkin Rose day and just looping his stuff, you know, just, just to get an okay from him, which I'm sure that would be no problem. Um, but, and then I thought about maybe asking him again to come on the show, but I don't want to rehash all the same shit that everybody else asks him and all the same questions and and whatever. Now, I could come at it from a totally different angle, and that's I've tried to do that in the past with certain people. A lot of the people I had on were the first that I really got deep into their story because I like to really get deep into uh, somebody's story of how they got into stuff and whatever but Larkin Rose is just so from his interviews and all the shows he's been on from his own speeches I mean there's just so inform so much information out there on him that if I did an interview about you know how he found the ideas of liberty and went through his life and whatever it, it, it probably you know wouldn't be all that great because all that stuff is, is out there. So I, I'd have to come at it from a totally different angle. Um, and it probably would be more of a, you know, do you want to come on and discuss stuff with me or something like that? But a lot of the people I, I, I did that interviews with, they've been on shows and stuff like that and people know who they are, but I tried to get in really into detail. Like I did two to three hour interviews with some, uh, the people that would actually allow me to. Um, and they were very interesting and I kept going with where it took me and my own curiosity about them and, and how it related to freedom and Liberty and stuff like that. And, and that's why I think if you look at some of the old interviews, even though the sound quality kind of sucks, um, 
some of them are very interesting. Now, I'm not saying I did a great job as far as I was, I think, a little stiff still. <laughs> that sounds bad. But I mean, you know, as far as my voice and whatnot. Um, but as far as the interviewee giving a, a really good interview, because I got deep into them personally and how it related to uh the focus of the show that it, it was interesting especially you know daryl perry of uh, free talk live and and ellen uh boss that slash stallone <laughs> of um i only laugh when i say that just because she's listed under uh ellen ball uh, under the uh interviews but um, she goes by Ellen Stallone, and that's a. I think she told me why. It's a long story, but anyway, she's the host of the Illumination Hour, which is on every Monday at seven o'clock Pacific, ten o'clock Eastern, and people seem to really like the show. I think it's she does a great job, and uh, she's very creative, and I think she's really happy with. Now, this is just, of course, my. Uh, my opinion from talking with her and, and listening to her show is that she's happy with what she's doing now with the, with her a show. Whereas in the past, I think that she was on, you know, I guess it would depend on the show, but you know, on free talk live, she was kind of in the background. You had three ho- hosts there. Um, so she didn't have much control, although she did get a chance to add to stuff and she did a good job. And then all her other shows were with co-hosts. And this one, she finally gets to do whatever she wants. And I don't interfere with that. I, I don't, um, you know, she just, she produces that show. It was totally her idea. I don't, you know, really, I haven't said anything. Um, although she, she did ask me for my feedback, which I I did want to give her, but I I don't really have much, uh, negative, any negative feedback that I can think of uh, off the top of my head. Um, she really does a, a great job and I think that she helps bring more listeners to the network. And I think she gives something different for people to listen to because it's still in the, the vein of freedom and Liberty, but it's like an abstract. I I can't, I can't even explain it. It's, it's more abstract and she puts a lot of creativity Uh, uses her creativity a lot within the show to just come up with all different types of things and ideas to talk about. And so if you haven't heard the show, at least, uh, you know, check out an episode. You know, if you don't like it, you don't like it. Actually, I'm playing the whole, uh, she's done 21 shows now. Um, Her last show yesterday featured uh, Andrew Mercer of Puke and the Gang. And that's a two-part show. So next Monday will be the second half of that show. But I'm currently playing, uh, as we're 24 hours, all of the shows. So we're in the middle of a a marathon, I guess, of uh, (laughs) the Illumination Hour. So being that most people are not staying up 24 hours a day, um, I'm definitely going to play it for at least another day because it's, you know, 21 hours of shows plus I added some clips some important clips in there but uh, getting back to as far as people that I hear out there um, before we get to our main topic tonight which is teens and and their rights and how parents I think abuse their rights along with the government and the whole system the system as a whole. And what happens is when you're a teenager, yeah, you try to your fight against the system. And then after you turn 18 or as you get not even 18, but maybe, you know, 21 and, 
and you kind of join the adult crowd and you don't give a fuck anymore and you're like, hey, those annoying, you know, teenagers. But for somebody like me, I think because of what I feel I went through as a teenager, I will never forget that. And I want to focus on... And I have in the past. I mean, we've done other shows where not teens specifically, but, you know, kids and kids rights and stuff like that. And I I want to focus on that because nobody fights for especially teens. Nobody's fighting for their rights because, again, I mean, they're probably you want to talk about oppressed people when it comes to uh, control. Maybe oppression isn't the right word, but when it comes to controlled people, teenagers are the most controlled. And at the same time, they have the mental capacity to realize it. It's not, you know, when you're a younger kid and your parents are telling you what to do and all that stuff. Most kids under 10 or whatever, they, you know, they rebel a little, but not like teenagers do because they feel like, hey, I know what I'm doing. Now, I'm not saying all teenagers know what they're doing, but they have the mental capacity to make these decisions, I believe. And I think as a parent, you should still help to guide those and and be uh, involved. But ultimately... I think it's up to them. And and I know a lot of people are going to totally disagree with me and have in the past when I get into this, but it really, it's one of those things that's like taboo to talk about. Um, or that maybe not taboo depends how, you know, that's more, I guess, younger age kids, but to talk about, um, it's like talking about, the police, like po- for politicians to talk about, you know, the rights of teenagers and having more freedom and stuff like that. It's something they'll never talk about. They'll never mention because what do they give a fuck? They're, they can't vote for them anyway. So they they could care less. Now, they are future voters, so they should think about that. But nobody gives a fuck about the rights of uh, teenagers. And I'm talking about, you know, 13 to... 17 even really to you know 21 but they care a little more when you're 18 because of the fact that you can vote but most 18 year olds don't vote anyway as i mentioned i never voted i had that one uh sort of vote that i i mentioned just uh to be completely honest but it didn't really count it was like a substitute i was at a different polling place and i really didn't give a fuck anyway so and that would be the only time. And that was what, 2012. So yeah, I, I don't vote because the whole fucking system is rigged and not rigged. Like Donald Trump says, uh, rigged against Trump, like fake votes and shit like that. It's rigged. Like I've talked about by the media and the parties and whatever. So he's just like, Oh, well there's bias against me. It's rigged against me. Well, in a way, it is, but it's not about you. It's about whoever's running against Hillary because the powers that be want Hillary to get in there so they can go more towards a socialist, communist oligarchy where all the people on the top, all the powers that be, will sit on the top while everybody else lives in, in poverty, essentially. So... um. Anyway, we'd be happy to hear from you. You can reach us via phone at 702-470-7664. That's 702-470-7664. Or you can reach us via Skype at Nonpartisan Liberty for All is the username. And uh, also, sorry, I was reading, a, I, I had a message on my, my phone. Um, and why is it? Oh, cause it's under her name. How the fuck do they do that? So these fuckers, I have my, my show phone 
is on my girlfriend's plan, right? So they send a message. I don't know how to get the number because the number is listed out there associated with the show. So they, she never wrote down the number on any thing or whatever. Um, and it's, it's a, I actually read this. So, um, it says, Hey Katie, it's Paula, a volunteer worker to help mobilize young voters for clean energy candidates. Early voting is open in Nevada until November 4th. Voting earlier is a great, great way to avoid the long lines on election day. Can we count on you to vote for Hillary Clinton? I should say, fuck you. Um, and not that, uh, I would vote for Trump neither because, again, as I just said, I don't vote and it's rigged anyway. So I I don't get whatever. I don't want to get into a whole thing on voting. You're one vote out of when you're voting for president, which people think is the most important thing to vote for. But your vote counts the least. So anyway, um, especially with the Electoral College, um, I guess that kind of makes it count more in a way the electoral college because if it was popular vote it really doesn't count but it still doesn't fucking it counts more if you live in a smaller state but if you live in a smaller state they have less electoral votes but the concept is obviously the less amount of people the more say you have but you don't have you can't possibly have any say even if it's just hundreds of thousands of people it's just ridiculous and even if somebody won by one vote, it's still, that doesn't mean anything. Well, they won by one vote. So see that one vote mattered. I mean, it, it's just, it's all bullshit. It's all a fucking illusion. Anyway, um, check us out at nonpartisanlibertyforall.com. You can get all that contact information if you forgot the phone number or the username for Skype. And... Also, links to our Facebook pages, other social media, articles, uh, original articles and blogs and all of that fun stuff. Um, Pictures of the police putting bruises all over me. And bruise is a, uh, using the word uh, bruise uh, is, fuck, what's the word I'm looking for? I hate that when, that always happens to me. Like, I'm thinking of a word and... I can't think of the word that I'm thinking of. My mind just goes blank, especially at night after, you know, getting up at fucking quarter or six and working all day. And, um, but is, uh, it's much bigger than a bruise. I, I, if there was another name for a, a giant bruise, I mean, it's just, my arm was ridiculous. Um, so are, you know, other parts, but I mean, my, my arm, like from my elbow to my, it was just crazy. Anyway, the, the pictures are on there as well. Um, but just to finish on Larkin Rose, uh, he's the only person that I really feel that has the same ideas. Now that doesn't mean we agree on every, everything, but I haven't really heard anybody talk about some of the stuff or a lot of the stuff that he talks about some of the stuff. Yeah. And it, it seems like this is one thing that, uh, that, uh, white supremacist, uh, what's his name or white nationalist or whatever he fucking calls himself, uh, Cantwell, uh, who's a conservative white nationalist or, radical right alternative right whatever the fuck i don't give a fuck what the correct terminology is but um that he uh now i totally forgot what i was gonna say um it was something to do with larkin rose um but that uh he had before I think said, uh, you know, some of the things before he became a white nationalist that, uh, Larkin Rose said regarding 
you know, the police and being able to defend yourself against police and stuff like that. Um, but I, I don't know what happened to him. He just went off the deep end. I actually respected him for the fact that he brought it up and nobody else would. And Larkin Rose uh, had done that as well. And it's a conversation that needs to be had just because you're a government agent. You can just do whatever you want to people. So nobody else talks about stuff like that. Oh, the thing that he said, this is sorry, what I was going to say is that a lot of the people in New Hampshire are more like progressive libertarians or whatever you want to call them. But they have a lot of those values. Now, they don't force it on anybody. So because there's a difference, there's there's trying to force things on people through government and then just wanting everybody to be free to be their own person and make their own decisions. And that's what they are. But their not lifestyle, but, and I'm not saying all of, um, everybody in New Hampshire and the whole free state project and whatever, but I'm saying there is a part of the free state project that is more progressive in their, uh, ideas. And I'm not talking about the people that, you know, um, what's that? The pop. I'm not talking about the polyamorist and all that shit. I mean, that's just more of, um, to me, you know, more of just freedom to do what whatever you want to do, um, type thing, as opposed to. I can't think of an example off the top of my head, but it's just more of the political correctness, really, that a lot of them are actually getting into political correctness. Now, not as a, well, this must be enforced by law, but there's less, I think, what people would call, and I hate labels like anarcho-capitalists, um, and I don't even like the word capitalism, the anarcho-free marketist or something, I don't know. I just explain what I believe in and take it as you want. But anyway, I I don't really see anybody that goes to the level, that level um, that he does. Um, So, and I'm, you know, I go, I would say I go to that level. I just don't do it as well. (laughs) And I try to cover all this different stuff where I think he focuses he has a, a smaller focus, which I think is, a, is a, in a positive way because he's trying to explain this shit to people so they get it, explain the truth to people. And, you know, that's why I said uh, there's a bunch of speeches that are similar because, you know, he would tour um and do speeches. But if this guy was anybody believed in anything else, again, he'd probably be a millionaire, but he's sitting out there struggling because he's doing it to get the ideas out. So I hope at some point he comes up with, um, you know, and I don't know how much money he has, if any, um, comes up with, some way to make money off of what he's doing to support himself um, through that because he puts, a, I know, a lot of time and effort into it. So anyway, I want to get to our topic for today. So before I get to, to anything, I saw something um, really disturbing um, and actually let me mention this too, which has nothing to do with today's, uh, subject, but I, I should have left more time for this. And that, that's why I used to do a three hour show because again, it, it's one time I kind of got a message from, it was only one person. And I think the reason why is because 
it was on YouTube and they didn't understand that, okay, this is a radio show. This is not a YouTube video about one thing. So at the beginning, you know, I did an introduction and maybe I talked for like 20 minutes before I got into the main topic, which I talked about the rest of the fucking show. Um, but they got mad and sent a thing like you took 10. Well, I think it was only 10 minutes, actually. I think I did it rather, rather quick that day and said, you know, oh, you took 10 minutes to get into this, you know, topic. And that's one reason why I I sometimes hate putting the topics, even though I want to, because that's the main topic, which means the majority of the show is going to be spent on that topic. But it's a radio show. So it's not going to be 100% on that topic. Now, it may be, actually, if it's something that I really need to get into right away because there's so much to talk about on it, occasionally I'll do that. But being that it's a radio show, it's not going to be, you know, it is what it is. I mean... I may go right into a topic. I may talk about a couple other things first. Usually with the radio show, even if you listen to, you know, one that's on the actual radio, they they usually don't focus on one one topic for one. They're, I don't know how the fuck they get these ratings, some of these guys, because they're just fucking morons and say the same thing over and over and over every day. Um, like... Uh, the guy who I talk about, the Constitution, Levin, and Michael Savage, and all of these guys. Um, And now Alex Jones is blowing Trump um, or something going on with them, I don't know. And I I just don't get it. So whatever. Uh, Alex Jones I got just because he'd come up with new information all the time. And um, he'd repeat a lot of the same stuff. I mean, you're on radio. There's only so much you can talk about. But there's so much, you know, I find so many things that are fucking going on, man, to talk about that relates to freedom. I I, I don't know why these guys got to talk. Well, I do know because they're, they're um, you know, Levin and the Savage and these conservatives are, are, you know, frauds. They're shills for the conservative, I, I don't know if you'd even call it a party, but whatever it is, and that's what they do. And they just try to pound these ideas in, in, into your head about the, you know, the conservatives. And you always hear, well, if it wasn't, if it was a liberal, then it would have been like this. And, and, and it's just the same shit over and over again. Um, now, I'm not saying I don't, talk about the same stuff or haven't talked about the same stuff. But I mean, I've done, well, they've done way more shows than me. So I got to give them that at least. But I went through so many different topics um, until I even got to similar topics. And, and, you know, so there's so much to talk about that it's like, you know, the only reason for me to talk about the same thing is because you don't always have the same listeners and there might be different people listening and and you want those ideas to get out there. So anyway, I just wanted to say real quickly that something that people might not know that the U S is in a whole bunch of wars, essentially um, they're bombing Yemen, Iraq, Syria. Well, every everybody knows about Syria. Um, some people know about Iraq. Yemen is just a constant. Like they go in and they bomb people, and that's been going on for fucking years. I don't know how far that's going. And I guess there's like a war basically with Somalia, from what I understand. And <clears throat> that you never hear about. Um, at least I never do. So they're just, you know, going after, I remember that whole plan that uh, Wesley Clark talked about that they're going to go after all these countries and destabilize them. And that's pretty much what they're doing. And I mean, a lot of it's about the petrodollar. I think the majority of it is about that, but it's also about their empire 
and control and, you know, not just controlling people here in other countries, but maybe the whole, uh, you know, as much of the world as possible that they can control and do it in a way that it looks like they're not doing it just like they do with the, the people in the U S they control everybody and they do it in a way that makes it look like they're not doing it. They have people fighting for them that, and I'm talking about the people that live in the U S that will defend the U S government and get mad and yell at people like me. Um, that got mad, like when Colin Kaepernick it didn't stand. And, uh, I guess that's a recent thing too, um, that they never used to, uh, either come out for the national anthem or stand for it or something. Um, but they, um, get all mad. They, they have convinced, <laughs> it's just so fucked up how they've convinced people of this whole lie and they have people that are defending them and it's just ridiculous. Okay. Anyway, I don't want to waste any more time, um, on other topics, but that's just interesting. You know, Somalia, I wasn't even aware of, I know that they supposedly, I thought they gave aid to Somalia, but you know, they're fighting in Africa. They, they want the resources. So, or the same thing, they want to stop any, you know, I don't know how much oil and where it is and things like that, but they don't want anybody selling oil unless they're selling it in U.S. dollars. And that's, if you're not, they're going to try to stop you. And you notice that that whole thing with nuclear weapons and nobody else getting nuclear weapons, of course, benefits the United States because they won't, they can't attack anybody who has nuclear weapons. And that's what it's about. It's not about peace or because why does the United States get to have nuclear weapons and Russia and all these other countries? Oh, we get to have them, but uh, you guys don't. Nobody else can have, we made a, we made a rule that, uh, you know, you guys can't have them, but we can, so we can invade your country and you can't do shit about it, which is pretty fucked up. So, Anyway, um, and that's a whole nother show, but which we've talked, uh, about some stuff like that before, but, um, talking about teens and, and we've kind of covered some of this before and really as a whole, just kids and kids rights and, and done shows on that. But I want to focus on teens because when I got into the shows about kids, it's really hard. And I've mentioned this before. It's hard to say at what age do you really, I mean, at a young age, I mean, kids are aware and they know what's going on. I mean, they're not stupid, but at the same time, at what point do you say um, you have the right to do whatever you want or that? And, and I would really have no age of anything, to be honest, because it, it's the same thing. And I'll just mention this briefly because we're going to go into teens, but I wouldn't have no, an age that you're not, uh, able to the restrictive age of 18. And the reason for that, to be honest, is, you know, no little kids are going to run away. And if they are, they're going to come back just like they would anyway. And they know they need to stay with their parents and all of that shit. And for the kids that, well, this is more when you get into teenagers and, and that's what we're going to talk about. But if there was nothing that kept kids with their parents, meaning that there was no obligation or there was no, or maybe there was an obligation, but the kids could leave if they wanted to. 
Do you really think that would change anything? Now, I think it would change a lot when it comes to teens. And I think in a positive way. Because you have abusive parents, you have all this shit, and I've, I've kind of talked about that before. But you have such restrictions on teens that most of the teens that it's so bad at home they leave end up becoming, you know, drug addicts or prostitutes or stuff like that. But part of that is because they can't get a fucking job that would uh, give them enough hours. I mean, if you're 15 years old and you want to work 40 hours a week, it depends on the state, I believe. I don't know what the federal law is, but I just remember from Massachusetts, you had to be at least 16 to work without a work permit. And if you were 14 or 15, you were very restricted on the amount of hours you could work. And I know that supposedly came from, you know, all the shit in the fucking 20s. Well, we don't have that problem anymore. Or parents trying to force kids to work. But see, this is the whole thing that having one law and getting rid of it, but keeping another law, it doesn't work. So in the sense that if you say that, okay, teens can work, if you're 13, you can work whatever you want and as many hours as you want and whatever. And you're worried about, well, parents are going to take advantage of that and make kids work and take all their money. But then at the same time, if, if you get rid of the law that says that they have to stay with their parents, then that eliminates that right there. Because then they can go stay with friends. They can rent a room. Um, it's not you don't have to make a lot of money to rent a room from somebody. So you know, there's things like that. And I'm not saying that 13 year olds should be on their own. That's not my my point. My point is that if you have a law because of another, it's like laws cause more laws. And the government loves that because they're in the business of laws. So if you have laws that you need to keep adding to, or you have a law that causes whatever issue or whatever problems, and it causes you to pass another law, that's a positive thing for the government because it's like, hey, we got to pass another law. And again, they're in the business of making laws. And we had another issue that, look, we resolved. We did something positive, and they look at it that way as well. So anyway, there was a girl I was watching or listening to a uh, – it was – juveniles in jail or something like that. And I couldn't believe the shit that they were in jail for. I mean, the the culture and I, I thought of I need to do another show on, on prisons. I've done shows on prisons but it's just ridiculous and that's why I say how much I disagree with the system even if somebody's a murderer I disagree with the system. Now that doesn't mean that I don't think that murderers and especially rapists, um, you know, and, and the serious criminals should be locked up. Of course, the percentage of that is, is pretty low. But at the same time, it's like, you know, even I think they're treated unfairly. So, but before I get to this girl, who what she did... And what the year she got was crazy. But um, there was another, there was a woman. At first, I, I ended up watching some um, prison or listening to some prison show or documentary. And she was 25. She said she shot somebody because he was a snitch, but that he was reaching for a knife. And she claimed self-defense. Now, that's her version of the story. Who knows what happened? But say she did... Um, you know, just 
shoot him, they had a confrontation and she shot him and killed him. She got life. And I think that that is insane. Because I don't see, you know, if she got 20 years and, and I'm, I'm trying to think and put myself in the shoes of the family or the, you know, I don't know. And I think it was a 16 year old actually. And, and that might've contributed to it, but she was 24. I mean, she wasn't that much older, I guess, you know, eight years older, but I mean, at 24, you're still pretty young too. So and she could have been even younger. It could have been 23 because she was 25 at the time. She had been in jail for a year and, you know, then you get to trial and all that. So she could have been like 23. I mean, I, I didn't see, you know, even though the government's arbitrary age of 18, um, he was under that. But she, I, I don't, I don't know that that's you know, if the kid was like 10 or something, I, okay, I, I see a difference, but I, I don't see really much of a difference. Um, because if they were two years older or maybe even a year and a half older, then they, it would be totally different, which is ridiculous. This arbitrary 18. Um, but anyway, so she killed him. And again, I'm sure he had a mother and but I mean, the stuff that she was into, I'm assuming that this was not somebody. And really, she wasn't into anything that but I think she was just doing and selling drugs. And for that, you shouldn't be in jail. But she's not in jail for that. She's in jail for murder. So for murder, you should be in jail. Um, although, again, not in this the way things are now, but you should definitely be, uh, there should be a long punishment there for taking somebody's life that you can't bring back. However, to give the girl life in prison at, you know, 24 years old, I think in that circumstance is crazy. I mean, I look at it as almost like a gang shooting, Um, and again, I mean, she could have been telling the truth as far as what happened that she thought, you know, if she was a cop, she'd get paid vacation, you know, but because she was a drug user or drug dealer, you know, she gets life, but the fact that she got life and it wasn't like she got a life sentence 15 years like they said that she was going to be in prison for the rest of her life. You know what I mean? Because there used to be, and I don't know if this has changed. I haven't followed what a life sentence is, but depending on what state you were in, a life sentence was like 15 years or something. Like they'd say, you know, a life sentence wasn't really your whole life. It didn't mean you were in jail for life. Um, And I don't know if she got life without parole because they didn't say that, but they said that she would be in there for the rest of her life. Now, maybe she can get parole, but there was this other woman who was in there for 32 years who had uh, broken to a house and robbed somebody and killed them to get money for drugs. Now, don't even get me into that because, of course, if drugs were affordable, and not illegal and cost so much money, it'd probably be a whole different story there too, but maybe not. Maybe she was just, you know, it wasn't just the drugs that made her a, you know, because there's plenty of people that do drugs that don't, you know, rob people at gunpoint as well. But just being in jail for two days waiting to get bailed out, and I was in just the, you know, the county jail and it's just horrible. Now I had some other stuff going on that I was stressed out about at the time. You know, it wasn't like, um, 
people knew where, uh, like, there were just things going on. Like, I had, I didn't know where my car was and if it got towed and my cat was at home and I was worried about my cat starving. To I mean, I, I'm sure there's, <laughs> I'm saying this and people are like, that's nothing compared to their problems. But um, I was in the middle of, uh, I, I had just applied for a job and I, I got it as long as my background check came back fine. And I was worried about that. And am I going to get fired? And it, cause it was a bullshit charge anyway, but it wasn't just the worrying about things. Although I'm sure that made things a lot worse. It was the whole experience and just being in a fucking cell, man. And, the food i didn't even eat anything in there i ate a roll because it just looked so fucking disgusting and i'm like there's no way you know i should be out of here soon um and i had paid bail and still had to wait and they do all that shit on purpose just to fuck with you and i've talked all about this before but my point being is just how bad jail is people don't understand that have never been in jail and before that i'd just been in you know holding cells at police stations but people that have never been in jail and i was barely in jail um they don't realize you know just having your freedom taken away in the first place now maybe people that don't feel like they have much to live for and don't give a fuck anyway and they don't have much of a life meaning um you know they're just out in the streets selling drugs or whatever which again i think should be legal so i i I don't have an issue with that but they end up in jail and they don't care because they don't have any obligations or anything like that or whatever which usually a, a lot of people do have family obligations like kids or a wife or whatever. So they care, I think, about that part of it. But as far as, you know, a career or whatever. So, you know, those are things that I had obviously worried about as well. Um, But at the same time, to put somebody in jail for 20 fucking, uh, sorry, for life, um, I would if she was in jail for 20 years or 15 years to me that seems or 15 years and then they review her case and uh for parole or something and give her 20 years I mean there were people that there was somebody that I I know not well but that you know, of course made a plea deal and maybe that's why maybe she went to trial and I think she did. And and that's probably why. And that's another issue with the fucking justice system, the injustice system. She, because she said that she claimed self-defense. So she might've went to trial. So they might've offered her a plea deal of like 10 to 15 years or 20 years or something like that. And she said, no, I'll go to trial. And they gave her life because that ha- that's happened to people as well that uh, in the, the case I was talking about, the person I knew, there was another person who I actually knew a little and he didn't even pull the trigger and he went to trial. They offered him, I think, like a plea deal for like eight years or something like that, or maybe not even that long. And he was like, no, I'm going to trial. And he went to trial and got life. So the whole system is fucked up. They don't want you to go to trial because they can't handle it. If everybody went to trial, the system would fall apart. They wouldn't have enough. And that's what everybody should do because the the whole fucking justice injustice system wouldn't be able to handle everything, you know, and in the majority of, of, of shit that happens, they would just drop. Because they drop all the drug stuff because they know it's all the nonviolent shit would get dropped because they couldn't they couldn't handle it. They couldn't they wouldn't have the time. 
you know, that's a way, that's another way to, you know, there are ways to, um, bring down the system, but you just need a lot of people to do it. And that's the problem. Getting the people to do it. If everybody went to trial, it would bring down the system or at least it would let all, all those people that shouldn't be going to jail or shouldn't be uh, charged with a crime period on uh, drug users, drug selling, possession, all of that stuff, all the nonviolent crimes, they'd all uh, get dropped because they, you know, what are you going to do? You're going to, you're going to, um, still go after them when you have actual real criminals, murderers and rapists and, and people that are, you know, beating people within an inch of their life and, you know, things like that. So, you know, there are ways to help bring down the system, but it's not by using the system. I wouldn't consider that, you know, using the system is oh legislation and stuff like that but anyways so there was a a girl who was a juvenile and she was charged as a juvenile i believe maybe they charge her as an adult but so and and she was uh 17 years old she's actually very pretty and they um charged her with I guess what happened was her and her friends went to somebody's house that they knew. This is so stupid. I don't even know why they did did this because obviously she's going to get caught. They went, um, she knocked on the door of somebody she knew and then her friends were behind her and one of them had a gun and they stole the person's TV. And of course they're idiots and they left prints in the snow and the police arrested them and whatever. But the fact that this girl got 10 fucking years for that is insane. I don't even know that she should have went to jail, to be honest. Over a TV because her friends robbed, you know, she got a lady to open the door so her friends could rob somebody for a TV. Really? That that should be jail? How about you fucking buy her another TV and, you know, you work a job for the state or something, whatever, that, um, you know, and buy replace our TV with a brand new one or something I, and you know pain and suffering i mean really money sh- to replace the TV in her case i guess the the guy with the gun and they really didn't even break in i i don't i don't get that and this is in uh i guess michigan city michigan city indiana it was in a documentary the girl's name was selena briggs and i feel so bad for her because, you know, assuming that that's totally what happened, um, and I believe it is, and the fucking 10 years, and she's 17. So they put her in the juvenile place. They have these juvenile jails now that they call, like, schools because they're – they try to rehabilitate and send kids to a school like environment and all of that shit. Um, but there's just so many kids that are in there that have done things that you shouldn't be in jail for. I don't get the jail culture. Um, we've talked about, uh, shows on, uh, kids in school that are getting arrested all the time. Not the same kids, but I mean, all these arrests going on at schools and how uh, kids end up getting arrested just for something stupid like 
was the kid who drew a gun. I don't know if he uh, got arrested, but there's like ridiculous shit. And I'm, I'll actually play some clips of that in, in a moment. But these jails were just full of ki- I mean, now, granted, some of the kids should have been there. Um, there was one kid, though, who accidentally shot his friend, was in there for three years. I didn't get that one when it was an accident. And, of course, they throw that in there, you know, to show, oh, look, guns are evil, whatever. They got to throw one of those in there. And I wasn't surprised at all that they uh, follow the kid that, you know, did that. But they never mentioned, you know, this kid, think about this, that this kid has to live. It was his friend. And he thought the gun wasn't loaded. And he, like, joked around and pulled the trigger. This is what they say happened. And the kid died. But there was no intent. There was no... And you could say, well, that's why he only ended up doing three years. But what is... Should he have done any time if it was an accident? What does that do? That doesn't bring him back. And this kid, for the rest of his life, is going to think about it. I mean... You could see that he was, he seemed like a good kid. I mean, I just saw him in a documentary. But I know if I did something like that, it would always be there in the back of my mind that, you know, I killed my friend. It wasn't even somebody, it's not like he killed somebody he didn't like. I mean, it was one of his friends and he was just, I don't know. So I I don't, isn't that punishment? enough um and and then again you try to put your yourself in the shoes of the family but what does that do if you look at it and as far as the family goes knowing that somebody's in jail which is a horrible place that the government i mean this cruel and unusual punishment they should take that i mean they just totally ignore that because cruel and unusual punishment exists. Now, the juvenile places weren't as bad. So I I do see that, that, you know, and they tried to help the kids and it wasn't as bad. But that was because the one I, the, the two that I um, listened to, one was in Indiana and one was in Arizona. And in Arizona, I guess it was because they had recently redone the whole fucking uh, system because it was so bad uh, how the kids were treated and they wanted to turn it into more like a school-like environment and try to help the kids supposedly is what they said because, you know, most of the kids were in there for things um, that weren't that bad and none of them really were like did any murders. The only person who had killed somebody was that kid and that was an accident and they you know they're they were just kids getting in trouble i mean there were kids in there for um one was in there for disorderly conduct now she had other stuff but it was like you know drugs and it just stupid shit shit that shouldn't even be illegal just because you're a teenager um if it was an adult, they might even get off, actually, um, or they would go to jail. Uh, I don't know. And, and they go to a worse place. But I think with kids, they they look at it differently in the sense, well... You have, I guess it's a double, double edged sword because in in some ways, if you're tried as a juvenile, you're not going to get the same punishment as, as an adult where it depends if, when it's a serious crime, but it seems like for the minimal, the smaller crimes that they want to put you in jail to like, try to rehabilitate you if you're older and you get arrested for some of these crimes, it's like fines or whatever or you go to jail but you go to less time it's weird um because they want you to be in jail so they can basically brainwash you 
Um, if you're a kid, if you're an adult, they probably think that, well, not totally, because they want to put a lot of adults in jail, too. They wanted to put me in jail over something ridiculous, um, having no record in the state of Nevada. And, and basically because they claim I said uh, I wouldn't get out of my car on private property to a cop. Based on that, I should go to jail. It's insane. And that's not even what happened. But anyway, we'll take a quick uh, break to play some clips. And we'll be back to talk more about teens and and their rights. And you can, of course, uh, check us out at nonpartisanlibertyforall.com, the number and the username at Skype, which is also Nonpartisan Liberty for All is there. So uh, the number again is 702-470-7664. So if you'd like to call in and we'll be right back after this, um, after these clips, nonpartisanlibertyforall.com. A girl allegedly dates and is getting married to her dad. Okay, (laughs) there's so much to this interview that has circulated the internet, social media. It's become quite the controversy. There are a number of different uh, questions from the interviewer and answer from her that I want to read. I want to also talk about a term called GSA, and GSA is a term for genetic sexual attraction in which, let's say, you were abandoned by your parents, your biological parents, or let's say you were adopted and then you get reunited with them later on, there is this study that suggests that there will be some very sexual romantic feelings. Half the time. Yes, half the time, but it also has, like, really scarce research, too. We'll get into all that. There's so much here that I feel like that I'm going to touch on it and also talk about the Q&A interview after our five words. Daddy's little girl, friend. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> to each his whole. Who is your daddy and who does he do? <laughs> Daddy's screwing her, literally, figuratively. Oh, that, that is things. disturbing to hear. <sighs> okay, Whoa. so let's talk about this interview. Here's two of the questions from the interviewer. One. So can you remember when it was like the moment you and your dad were reunited? Was there an instant attraction? She says, it was so weird and confusing. Mind you, she's 18 years old right now. Okay, I was seeing my dad for for the first time in forever, but it was also like, he's so good looking. And then I was like, what the hell are you thinking? What is wrong with you? I saw him as my dad, but then also part of me was like, I'm meeting this guy who I've been talking to over the internet. They reconnected on Facebook and really connecting with, and I find him attractive. They had not seen each other for 12 years. This ruins the song for the first time in forever for me. (laughs) Because she said, I was reading it, it's like incest, and it's like, for the first time in forever... I'm having sex with my dad. Okay, let's talk about that, because that's the next question, and then, then we'll, we'll talk. Was there a single moment you realized that you were sexually and romantically attracted to your dad? She said that after they'd been talking, she went and stayed with him for five days. On the fourth day, um, she, they started wrestling, and she had bit him in a playful way, and she got goosebumps. He pinched her... <laughs> Mm -hmm. in the thigh, and he got goosebumps. Mm -hmm. So then she says, quote, we stopped and said that we didn't know what was going on, but admitted that we had strong feelings for each other. We discussed whether it was wrong, and then we kissed, and then we made out, and then we made love for the first time. That was Uh when I lost my virginity. Then the rest of the interview talks about how they fell madly in love. She's keeping it a secret from her mother and her side of the family. He told his parents, so her grandparents, her on the dad's side, They've given their blessing. They want them to have children. He had a girlfriend the whole time. She heard them making love, but has accepted their relationship as well. And that's where it all uh, ends. And they're going to go get married and have a life in New Jersey where it's not illegal to have adult incest. With so many parents packing their kids off to college right now, it's natural for both sides to feel a little separation anxiety. But Chris Conley's been following a new phenomenon. Mothers whose apron strings reach all the way to college dormitories. From doing laundry to wake-up calls, they're confusing letting go with never can say goodbye. It's a new school year, and that means college kids are about to learn a big lesson from their techno-savvy parents. You can run, but you can't hide. Dad? 
Cool it with the Twitter updates, okay? I'm sitting on the patio. I know you're sitting on the patio. As these Verizon ads spoof, media mad moms and dads are texting, tweeting, even friending their college freshmen on Facebook, eager to stay close to their kids long after the minivan has pulled away from the dorm. Those who felt the power of parental omnipresence include Ethan Lewis and his brother Brandon. Hello? Hi. How was Polly Sci this morning? Mom? Hey, I just, just got your email. Hello, Bren. Hey. How did the human geography quiz go? Hi, Ethan. Hey, what's going on? You don't have class on Thursday at 1 o'clock? Hello. Hey. Hello. Hey. Hello? Are you having trouble with the phone? No, I had it on vibrate. You should take it off vibrate unless you're in class so that you can um, hear me. Robin Lewis is a single parent who homeschooled her sons. And just because Ethan and Brendan are out of the house, <laughs> and she's taken on a full-time job, that doesn't mean she's losing interest or hour-by-hour hour involvement oh, in her boys' one. lives. Every single day, like this one. Hi, Ethan, it's Mom. It's 9.10, and I know you have class at 9.30. Later, she makes another call to Ethan. Hi, hi, Ethan. Hey, what's going on? I'm good, how you doing? Did you just get out of class? She checks an email from Brendan. History quiz is going to be on the first 13 chapters. Sends an email to Ethan with his fall schedule. Makes another call to Ethan. What are you doing this afternoon? I have to meet some people at 5. Socially? Um, no, no, study. Oh, study group? Study group, yeah. Then she calls Brendan. Are you going to be able to get that math thing for me? Um, yeah, yeah, I was, I'm going to do that today. Like, I have a few things that I'm... Well, why don't you call me after Human Geography and let me know how the quiz went. All right, will do. Your American Lit class, because it goes to three to register... When she's not talking to her so boys... Well, and, and you're doing so much. And Robin's organizing their lives. She spends an hour drafting to-do emails for her sons. He did so well on... Checking their grades. 98 out of 100 on his history essay. Checking their bank accounts. And it looks like Brendan's going to need a few dollars for the weekend. Even using their personal passwords to check their student email. Something about a conference reminder. Her tools of the trade include this stuffed purple folder. I've made notes that he's going to be graded on 10 quizzes, a book review, one exam, midterm, final. And I even check off each week as we go. Even a dedicated cell phone just for the boys' calls. And this is the hotline. One of the boys calls me at 1020. And I can say to them, wait a minute, you can't be calling me now. You're supposed to be in history class. <laughs> and then they'll go, oops. <laughs> Robin works tirelessly to keep those oops to a minimum. She proofreads her son's papers at lunch. And Brendan and Ethan both say they're grateful for their mom's efforts on their behalf. She wants to make sure that I do it well in it. And it's all because, you know, she cares, which is great. Because, you know, then it's like I don't have to make a list and I can just print it out and it's there. So it, it saves me a lot of time. In the wellness storm? It, it's nice to have someone else that uh, kind of serves as <laughs> maybe a secretary, secretary mom. <laughs> One of your sons, I think, referred to you as like a secretary mom. Well, I think, that, I think that's great. It means that I'm very organized. <laughs> Would that be ready by Saturday? You know, a secretary helps to keep the boss focused and organized, right? We, we don't know how to balance much of our lives yet when we're 18. No one could deny Robin loves her sons and wants them to succeed. Not everyone thinks that she's helping them. I can understand why a parent would think I'm just doing what I think is right for my son or daughter. The problem is they're doing exactly what's wrong for their son or daughter. Helen Johnson, author of the book Don't Tell Me What to Do, Just Send Money, is a consultant on parental relations for some of America's top universities. She says parents like Robin are far too involved in their children's lives. In taking over, they are sending a profound message. You are not capable of handling your life. Helen Johnson is more than familiar with the term in vogue to describe someone like Robin, a helicopter mom. A helicopter mom is a mom who hovers over every stage in her child's development from basically now in utero 
through the college years and beyond. Administrators say helicopter moms and dads have become a campus phenomenon. To harness the influx of eager parents, 96% of colleges now have orientations designed just for mom and dad. 70% of schools have so-called parent coordinators. Some campuses have even added high mom cameras, where parents can hover from thousands of miles away. But Robin Lewis says she doesn't hover, she helps. She even drives two hours to Ethan's dorm and twice a month does his laundry. Did you check all the pockets? Make sure nothing's in the pockets. She shops for his groceries. Wow, looks like I have a lot of cleaning to do. Picks up his dorm room. She even does the dishes. Isn't it time for him to say, yeah, I don't like it like this, I'll clean it up, or to live that way? And one. he'll tell me that. He'll tell me that. I think that's probably more coming from me that I just want to tidy up. We don't need any green tea. Robin is justly proud of the artistic and intelligent children she's raised. She's like the most selfless person on the face of the planet. I mean, she just you know, we'll give and give and give and give and give. And when she's, you know, got nothing left to give, she'll keep giving. She has succeeded in every aspect of giving my brother and I everything a kid can ask for. But for Robin, letting go can be the hardest thing of all because the lists and the calls don't just help her sons, they help her stay close to them. These habits are very hard to break, and I know I'm still doing them. I'm trying to wean them off more and more so that they can become more self-reliant. But you don't want to do that, do you? You want to talk to them three times a day. You want to make the to-do lists. You want to read their books. You want to read their papers. I want them to be able to um, become their own person as long as we stay close. And I don't want to feel that, that all of this, you know, micromanaging mothering crippled them in any way to not be able to relate to other people. In fact, Robin says her relationship with her sons has evolved from constant monitoring to close friendship. Ethan, she says, dropped out to pursue a career in music. Brendan, armed with a degree with honors in global studies, is traveling the world. Robin believes her parenting style has made her sons uniquely independent, yet she still emails, IMs, and calls, and knows that one day she'll face an even greater separation. Together again. And of course, when they get married, you know, that's that, that I'm not going to be the most important person there. And, and I know that. Of course, I know that. You know it, but how does it feel? You go through a period of withdrawal, and then hopefully you get to be best friends with their wife, and, and you have a good relationship, and then she'll call you and tell you what he's doing. <laughs> to whom does your life belong? Who owns you? Most people instinctively answer, I own myself. But most people don't actually believe that. What does it mean to own something? It means that you and you alone have the right to decide what is done with that thing. What is yours you can use, you can trade, you can give away, you can destroy. So what does it mean to say you own yourself? It means that you and you alone have the right to decide what is done with your body and your mind, with your time and your energy. If someone else had the right to decide what is done with your body and your mind, your time and your energy, then he would be your owner and you would be his slave. So, are you anyone's slave? Do you pay taxes? Do you feel obligated to obey whatever the politicians decide to call law? Do you imagine that someone else has the right to control you, to rule you? Do you vote? In every political election, you are asked to decide who you want owning you, but owning yourself is never one of the options offered. The only choice you are given is the choice of which politicians will coerce and control you by way of so-called regulation and legislation, and confiscate what you produce by way of taxation. Whoever wins, you will be extorted and dominated. When you vote, whether you win or not, you are accepting that someone else has the right to rule you. You are conceding the state's authority over you. You are agreeing that you are going to be someone's slave, with the only question being which political master will own you. If you believe that you have an obligation to pay taxes, 
If you can see that it is up to someone else to decide how much of your earnings they will let you keep, then you are their slave. If you own yourself, you don't need the permission of anyone, any individual, any group, any collective, any country, any legislature, to run your own life, make your own choices, and keep the fruits of your own labor. As long as the politicians see you voting, petitioning, protesting, and campaigning, begging for tax cuts, whining for different legislation, as long as they see you timidly obeying whatever commands they issue while begging them to change their so-called laws, then they know that they own you in mind and body. Writing or calling your congressman merely tells him that you still think he's important, that you still view him and his fellow parasites as authority, and that you still think it's his choice whether to let you be free or not. As long as you play their games and legitimize their system, obeying their so-called laws and paying their so-called taxes, acting as if they are your rightful lords and masters, the tyrants know they have nothing to fear. The slave master doesn't mind his slaves pitifully begging for mercy, as long as they keep obeying and keep producing wealth for the master to steal. Those in power aren't worried about elections or petitions. What they do fear is that one day their victims will realize the truth, will stop believing in the divine right of politicians, will stop calling liars and crooks lawmakers, will stop calling the tyrants mercenaries law enforcers, will stop believing that anyone has the right to rule them, will stop imagining authority where there is none, will realize that they own themselves, and will stop bowing to the parasitical anti-human beast called government. If you own your time and effort, and the fruits of your labor, then stop asking nicely to be allowed to keep it. If you own yourself, then stop asking nicely for legislative permission to run your own life. If you actually believe in unalienable rights, in individual liberty, in freedom, then stop asking nicely for the sociopathic parasites to let you be free. For humanity to be free, people need to stop thinking, talking, and acting like slaves. Stop bowing to megalomaniacs. Stop paying tribute to sociopaths. Stop obeying political parasites. If you truly understand that you own yourself, then start acting like it. Nonpartisan liberty for all, and we are back. Um, a lot of information, I guess, in that. Well, not a lot of information, but a good example of what they're calling now helicopter parents, and that had to do with uh, college kids. So being that, of course, I believe, excuse me, I think I burped there. Um, Being that I believe in the principles of freedom, if the kids are okay with it, then, you know, I guess that's fine. But we're talking about a different level here because in that, and and I had played that just because, well, one, I have so many different fucking clips and I found that one and I wanted to play a helicopter uh, moms. I didn't realize that was about college, but they're of age where they have a choice. So I don't know how that mother was when they didn't have a choice. And it's kind of like a boss employee relationship in that not at their level, although if their parents are paying for college, it is. And I mean that in, in the sense of you, uh, your boss has power over you and you, you realize that you realize that they could change your life and totally fuck it up by just firing you. Maybe or not. I mean, if you, depending on, um, you know, what you have for savings or whatever, but unless you're independently wealthy, 
it's still going to affect your life. Or you can find a job like really quick. Um, But for the most part, they have some power over you. So you may feel obligated when it comes to certain things. So it's kind of the same thing in that one, you know, bringing your kids up over a period of time in a certain way, they're going to feel like that. And if you're paying for their, their college, well, there you go. That's why when it comes to any relationship, if you control the money, it gives you some control over that person, whether you take advantage of that or not. And hopefully you don't. So I don't know if they were paying for college or not. And that's a little different because they could say, look, you know, I, and I think this happens a lot with, with rich families too, where, uh, and I was going to say they could tell the parents, you know, leave me the fuck alone. But they actually said that they liked it and whatever. And maybe they did and they were being truthful, but maybe they didn't and they felt obligated to say that based on how they were brought up and the fact that possibly their parents are paying for college uh, very likely. Um, it sounded like I could just, it sounded like a, a family that, and this sounds kind of weird. How can you tell from listening to that? But it sounds like a family that where they were helping them, at least helping with college. Whereas in my situation growing up, you know, I was very independent um, from, you know, the beginning, really. Um, I was, I, <laughs> I came out independent. I was like, fuck this shit. No, but I mean, since I was a, like a little kid, I was pretty independent and very when I didn't agree with something and very stubborn and I would stand up to my parents if I disagreed with them. Now, in general, I was quiet and shy until something came up that I totally didn't disagree that I disagreed with and that frustrated me. Especially if something frustrated me, that's when I would just, I would flip. But if it was, you know, I agreed with things, you know, I was fine. It's just like I remember in high school, I you couldn't wear hats. And this is one of the ridiculous things that I'm, it, it all fits in with what we're talking about. That they make rules just to make rules because you're a fucking teenager and they're going to tell you what to do. And they want to teach you discipline. And I was even listening to an interview with some guy who wrote uh, some fucking parenting book. And I wish I had the name because I think he's a moron because he, he made a statement that they would say, Oh, well, back in the day, you know, you just smack a kid in the mouth when they disrespected you. And they were like laughing about it. Like, that's funny. Is that really funny? Seriously? I mean, I got hit pretty hard. I got punched. My father would say if he was still alive that, no, I never beat you up, um, you know, or whatever that he held back. And I think most of the times, not every time, but I think when he threw punches, that he may have held back or the times that he didn't, I was able to cover myself up enough that I didn't get that hurt. Or, you know, I, I got pretty tough later on where I could take a beating, (laughs) but by that time he really wasn't hitting me anymore because he was worried about, you know, um, he had a bad back and he's worried about me hitting him back because probably if a fight lasted 30 seconds when I was growing up, um, because he was always bigger than me, I was always pretty skinny. If the fight lasted 30 seconds, he would probably win. If I was able to last the first 30 seconds, I would probably win because he'd run out of breath and I just fucking, I could 
you know, hit him in his back or something. And not that I'm talking about this in a way that like, this is what I wanted to do. I'm just saying that. Um, and the last time he actually punched me, I was 17 and my nose started bleeding. Now, I don't know. He kind of threw a punch like over my mother, sort of. So I don't know if he threw it as hard as he could because um, could he knock me down with one punch? I mean, I weighed 140 pounds. Probably if I if he threw it as hard as he could and I wasn't ready for it, but I knew he was going to throw a punch and my mother kind of tried to break it up. So it's possible that he did like try to throw it as hard as he could and he didn't connect full strength because my mother kind of, you know, tried to grab his arm sort of or got in the way a little of his arm with her arms. And um, he still punched me hard enough where my nose started bleeding. And that's the last time he actually hit me. When I was 21, he pushed me and threatened, like, he's like, if I wasn't in the shape I was in, I'd kick your ass. So once I got to a point, and when I was 17, I was getting, you know, that's when I started fighting in junior high. And I wasn't the toughest person. And I know there's a lot of people, if anybody's listening, (laughs) that I went to school with. And it will, you know, some people will have different opinions. I wasn't the toughest person, but I would fight most people if they fucked with me. There was a period and people don't realize this because if they fucked with me during this period, I was I got so scared because when I was 14, I got arrested and I was on probation and the system just fucking it really fucked me up. And when you're a kid and you don't know your rights, and of course they don't teach you them and and all of this stuff, the system, that's what they try to do. They try to scare you and shit. So for during that time I was on probation, if somebody, you know, fucked with me, as long as they didn't, you know, try to hit me, um, I didn't really say anything because I didn't want to get, you know, I knew if I got in a, if it was at school, at least, um, I didn't say anything or get in a fight with them because I'm like, okay, I'm gonna, um, you know, the probation officer might find out and, you know, I'm not going to go to no fucking juvenile jail and shit. So, and not that I was scared actually of, because jail is a juvenile, as I was just talking about, it's not the same thing. But it was just like the thought of being locked up and having your freedom taken away. I actually, I don't know what was going through my head. I knew I didn't want to go to jail at the time, but I don't know exactly what I was thinking. Um, anyway, because really when I think about it now, the ju- juvenile jail, I probably wouldn't have given a fuck. Um compared to, you know, the jail jail. And, and, and I don't know, uh, how bad it was back then or the details or whatever. Um, because I never, you know, when I get arrested as a juvenile, like I was saying, um, you just sit at the, I would be in the jail at the police station and see the difference in Massachusetts, at least back then, as opposed to the extortion that's going on in in Nevada when it comes to bail, is your bail, and you know what pisses me off too, and I know I'm changing the subject, but I'll get right back to it, is I watched that show um, about the Clark County Jail. They had a show, and they were releasing all these people on personal recognizances, right? So I get arrested for something that's not even a crime, number one. Like they, uh, it got dropped three days later. I I said this before. I got a letter from the DA and said, we're not pressing charges because even the DA was like, are you fucking kidding me? Um, the, everything was illegal. They did. And even what I did wasn't even a crime. They claimed, uh, obstruction of a police officer because they said I lied to them, uh, that they asked, do you have any illegal weapons? And I said, no, because I had a little tiny pocket knife. 
and that wasn't illegal. And then they arrested me. They said I had an illegal knife and the knife wasn't illegal. And they asked to search me and I said no. And they searched me anyway. And they pulled me out of my car for no reason. And the whole thing was just a bunch of bullshit. So they were like, you know, and the difference was the other case. That's why I've always said don't get arrested in Las Vegas because the city attorney only deals with minor misdemeanors. So to them, they're not going to drop anything. The district attorney deals with murder and shit like that. So when he gets a little case like he got of mine, they probably looked at it. Not only did they look at it and say, you know, I could have fucking sued the department or at least made a complaint, but I made a complaint before and it didn't make a difference. So I'm like, whatever. But not only did they see that, but also they're like, well, you know, this is a bullshit case and we have, you know, actual real cases to deal with. But nothing happens to the cops, of course. They get away with whatever they want. But the other case um, went to the city attorney, and it was an obstruction of an officer, which was a bullshit case, too. It's a minor misdemeanor. And my point is that they didn't let me out on personal recognizances, and it was the first time I was arrested in Nevada, and they, I, I don't, it, it wasn't even nothing. And, and I think the reason why, and they were letting people out with, and I don't think this, you know, I think it should be legal, but they actually take this seriously. I mean, there were, there were felony drug charges. There were like felony crystal meth possession and shit like that, that people got personal recognizances and they had been arrested before. And I'm like, what the fuck? This, I mean, maybe it was because they were filming and they wanted to show, oh, yeah, you know, and they were uh, tourists. That's probably why, too. They were tourists and they wanted to show, hey, if you aired on TV, oh, look, we're, you know, and they tried to show how nice they were. So that's probably why. But the reality, so basically the reality is not what they showed on TV. Anyway, because um, I didn't get personal recognizances. Uh and in Massachusetts, it was either personal recognizances or like $25 bail. It was, you know, for minor shit. The, the most amount I ever had was 500 bucks, And that was for something way more serious, even though, you know, uh, it got taken care of in court. But, um, you know, before you go to court, you're, despite what they say, you're assumed guilty until proven not proven innocent, but not having enough evidence to prove you guilty. So, um, back to the whole, um, juvenile thing. So I don't know if my father ever hit me hard enough where, you know, as hard as he could, except for, I mean, there were a couple times, um, but I, I'm assuming he could pr hit pretty hard and, you know, but it got to the point where he knew that, okay, like when I was 17 and he hit me, I was ready to fight him. And my mother, you know, got in the middle of it. I remember it was, uh, what super, uh, super bowl it was the day of a super bowl. Actually. Um, I actually even know who won that year. So that's the last time he hit me. Now, I would never get grounded or anything like that. I can't remember getting grounded. I think the only time I technically got grounded was when I got suspended from school. And he just said, you can't go out while you're during the school hours or something. I don't know. Which I ended up going out anyway because I babysat uh, these uh, these two little girls that lived uh, a couple doors down that my parents were friends with the, she was a single mother and my parents were friendly with her and I used to babysit them and the little girl loved me. And, um, it's funny cause I, <laughs> I saw them on Facebook and one of them is I think the exact same age as my fiance now it's it's weird but i saw one maybe it was myspace it was that long ago 
But I, I sent a message because they were so little. The littlest one, who was really cute, um, I doubt she even remembered. But I sent an e- I sent a message and I tried to mention the place and her mom and and figuring that she'd go ask her mom and um, maybe reply and she didn't reply so. Maybe she didn't get the message because I know if it was Facebook, it you you usually don't see if you're not friends with somebody, you won't see the message. Uh, I've gotten messages where I wasn't friends with somebody and I didn't even notice I got a message from them till way later. So it might have been that. Who knows? But um, it was just weird to see, you know, you could see their their main picture. And it's like these two little girls I used to babysit for. And they're like all grown up. They're like girls I would date now or something. I mean, I wouldn't date them because of I would still see them as those little girls. But I mean, they're, you know, around the age of girls. It's just weird. Um, Anyway, that's a whole nother kind of getting off topic here. But that's part of the reason why, you know, I look at kids and, or teenagers especially, and I got so frustrated that I felt like I was trapped. And the reason why I'm telling my story, which I talked a little about it before, but not much, but is to show or relate to how some of these kids may feel because they don't choose to be here. One, one quote from, um, Stefan Molyneux, who's a, to me, he's a hit or miss type guy. Sometimes I can't stand him. Sometimes, uh, I think he does really well, but, it's more um, the stuff I, I really like, to be honest, is just more the what I call the mindless stuff. When um, somebody calls with like a relationship question or something and he gives his, you know, he, he thinks he's the expert uh, psychologist or whatever um, or sorry, philosopher and gives his um, of course, his voice makes him sound more credible too. <laughs> but um, I, I haven't heard a lot of the one of the things that pisses me off is you see his episodes, right? And I only see the ones on YouTube just because I usually listen at work for something to listen to. I wouldn't listen to him outside of work. Um, but I can't, you know, a lot of some anything streaming is blocked. So. YouTube is not for whatever reason. So what I usually do is I'll, I'll listen to YouTube documentaries or I'll find something long to listen to. So I don't have to, you know, keep going in there while I'm working and changing what I'm listening to. I'll just, you know, put something on that's like an hour or a couple hours and listen to it or, you know, find some playlist of stuff or, or something like that. So one thing he did say, and I I like his, his um stance on kids but oh as i was saying the the you know there's like 10 to 15 shows in a row and i was saying on youtube i don't know what's on his actual uh other applications that he's on and i'm sure he's on a bunch but it's all about trump Hillary, Trump, Hillary. I mean, and this is a guy who calls himself an anarchist and he's so involved in the election and loves Trump. And he's more of a I would look at him as more of a conservative. I'm sorry. I I can't, you know, and, and maybe it's more of, okay. well, I'm looking at things based on this is how society is as opposed to how you want society to be. However, and from what I've heard, he, he people have said he's he's great and whatever, but that was more his old stuff and that he's changed a lot. And maybe that's the case. But I haven't heard 
a lot of stuff that has to do with anarchism that I agree with that he said. Um, I just haven't heard him really talk a lot about it, to be honest, because he's always talking about Trump and shit like that. And then I'll, I'll go and find uh, calls that he does, which are, are entertaining. But I mean, I'm not, you know, it, it doesn't I don't really get anything out of it. As far as knowledge or anything like that, I just get entertained. You know, a girl will call up and talk about her relationship and he'll give his philosophical analysis and yell at them and tell them how he's right based on philosophy and how philosophy is all based off facts and whatever, none of its opinion and whatever. But one of the things that he did say is, you know, and, and one of the things that I agree with him on to a point, because I, I don't think he goes far enough as far as uh, freedom when it comes to kids and non-discipline and stuff like that, but that kids don't choose to be where they are, meaning that kids don't choose to be born to their parents Kids don't choose to be born at all. So when you have a kid, you chose to have that kid. They had no choice in the matter. And they can't leave. They're stuck there. So if they're in a bad or fucked up situation, there's not a lot that they can do about it. So... People have to keep that in mind when, you know, and the whole power uh, relationship or almost going back to the boss, you know, employee relationship, you control their life and they or you at least have the power to control their life and they know that and it's like an unfair, you know, I, I know that you support them. But at the same time, you made the decision to have them in the first place. So I want to focus more on teens because, like I said, when you get to younger ages, it's it's hard to, you know, I, I find it hard to look at, you know, self-ownership and say, you know, when do you say somebody can make a consensual choice of anything because they own themselves? And some of that gets into shit that I don't even want to get into. And I don't, I don't know. Uh, and I don't have kids and I, that's something I'll have to, I guess, you know, having kids, would help me to, I guess, see that differently or see it from another side because right now I'm seeing it from the kid's side still. And especially from the teenager side. Um, but even as, you know, 8, 9, 10, I remember all these things as well. So, but at least with teenagers, you know, first of all, they have regardless of what people say, I mean, they used to get married at 13 and 14. I mean, there's a reason why puberty starts around that time that, you know, 13 and 14 year olds can have kids or 12, even 12. It, it depends. I mean, some girls, their puberty starts at eight, but I think that's more from these chemicals that they're fucking putting in, uh, bottles and food and shit like that. I honestly believe it has something to do with that because I, I believe that there was a study that the age had gone up. I mean, how you, you know, all studies are, I think, skewed, but still, um, you know, as far as I knew, most girls, it would, you know, 12, 13, 14, um, at least by 14. 
and I never heard anybody at eight or nine until recently <clears throat> somebody that, cause I don't know if she wants me to say it, but just girls I know that are adults now that have told me, um, that they have and their friends were too at that age. And I'm like, really? I never fucking heard that before. And they're significantly younger than me. So, um, like eight to 10 years younger. So that makes a lot of sense with the, you know, the chemicals and the things like that, but that's a whole, a whole nother issue. But this whole, um, one, the discipline thing. And I mentioned schools. So of course I believe that government schools shouldn't exist. But if they are going to exist, the discipline in schools, especially now with the police, and we've talked about the police and how, I mean, they're arresting elementary school kids for ridiculous things. They're handcuffing them. They're doing all this shit. But they're t- they're getting them ready, telling them, hey, this is what your uh, future is going to be like um, because we're going to, you know, have so many laws that basically everybody's going to get arrested. But the freedoms, first of all, that kids in government schools have, if you, you add that in, so you have parents, you have the government, and now you have police that are there and you have a school that wants to teach you discipline as well as a teenager. Now, When you're younger, I still don't think schools should teach discipline, period. But when you're younger, it's a lot different, although I'm not supporting that neither. But just focusing on teens, once you hit high school, you know, you're 14, and really once you hit, you know, I would say 13 because if we're we're talking teenagers, we'll say 13 because that's a teenager is 13. So you've had 13 years of your life where your parents supposedly were instilling values in you and bringing you up and uh, all of those things that happened during those years of being a parent. And parenting your kids, um, regardless of the parenting style, that at a certain point, I believe that, and and I know people are totally going to disagree with me, but if anything, I believe at least at minimum that at 13 you should be able to do whatever you want to do. Now, I know right away people are going to say, that's fucked up, 13-year-olds. Look at, well, first of all, what's been happening over the past at least 20 years, if not longer, is that kids are being babied more. And I played that clip. So my grandfather joined... (laughs) <laughs> it fought in World War II when he was 14. So I guess he looked a lot older and he lied about his age. And back then, you know, they didn't have the, luckily, they didn't have the tracking that they have now. So he lied about his age and he fought in World War II when he was 14. But that's okay because it was back then. But what is the difference? And there really isn't. And the same thing where you could say people got married. Well, but people died at, you know, whenever. And I know there's things that people learn and things change for the good based on that. And I'm not saying that 13-year-olds should be getting married. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that they should be treated more with more respect and more like adults than having to ask permission from their parents 
you have parents that will punish a kid just for disrespecting them. They're being forced to go to schools where they're being disciplined there, sometimes to the point of getting arrested. Now, it's like making something illegal. You know, if you try to stop a kid from doing something, they're going to do it. And I know this is not a popular parenting method um, with uh, people like who I had on the show, Dana Martin, where basically her kids can do whatever they want. And I believe in that. And I know there, and that's where, like I said, depending on the show that you're listening to, you may or may not, you know, agree with what I'm saying. But I'm consistent when it comes to freedom. You could say whatever you want about me. Um, you could say that I'm not consistent when it comes to freedom, but I am. I mean, it's it's a fact. You listen to any show, and I'm always consistent. And I always take the route of freedom. And I believe in self-ownership. And I believe, you know... I'm going to say, you know, teenagers, because that's what we're focusing on. But people own themselves. Parents do not own their kids, first of all. And they have to learn that. And and again, I hate to be somebody who tells people what they have to do. Um, but when it comes to owning people... There's certain things that, you know, I'll tell people, you know, maybe not have to do, but that it's wrong for them to, I should more say that because really people don't have to do that. They can, they can say they own their kids and the law would probably support them. So, and same with killing somebody. I mean, I could say you have to not kill somebody. I think that's a double negative, but you could kill somebody. It's just, you it's not right and you're going to go to jail unless, you know, it's in self-defense, which is fine. But when it comes to kids, part of the reason now, and I, this is all by design in my opinion, is kids have been so babied. And if you look at why, and I was listening to another uh, show where still their parenting method that they agreed with didn't go far enough, but they were definitely saying that parents were going too far. But they talked about some movie in the 80s, and I didn't remember it by name, but I remembered a similar movie with a kid that got kidnapped or something like that, and then they mentioned something else from the 80s that I forget what it was, but I remember um, hearing about it when I was a kid. And it was back when they had mentioned, you know, a lot less TV. Like now there's so many channels, there's internet, there's, you know, video games, whatever. There's so many things to do. That's why if you look at ratings um, compared to 50 years ago or 40 years ago, it's just totally different. I mean, you're successful at such a lower amount. So... And you have a higher population too. But you used to just have the majority of the people had the, just the main, you know, five channels or whatever and some UHF stations. And of course, cable came, but even with cable, initially it didn't have, you know, 200 channels or whatever they have now. It maybe had like 30, or most people had, you know, maybe 30, to, if that. So people saw this shit and the same thing that I did a show on either last week or the week before about putting things in perspective applies in this situation because when you put things in perspective, because I, I guess there, it, there was a couple uh kidnapping movie that might've been based on a true story or something. And then, something else or whatever. So one or two kids that get kidnapped 
and people see that and it's like, oh my God, the whole fucking, the, the chances of your kids getting kidnapped are now whatever, just because one or two kids got kidnapped. Even though nothing changed, what changed is your perception. And your perception is not reality. So because of that, not just that, what they had said, but in general, because of media, government media, just like now, the way that they show things or not don't show things or don't put things in perspective, people, it changes the way not only people think, but the way they act. Because, you know, you watch the local news and again, you see a murder happen every night or something and you live in a city of 3 million people, the metro area or whatever, or 2.5 million people, you know, 365 people that got killed in a metro area of 2.5 million isn't too many. And of course, a lot of them are, you know, the majority are not random neither. So how much does that put you in danger? Well, basically it doesn't. So point being is that because they don't put things in perspective, they got totally scared. I remember in the eighties, like somebody put a razor blade in an apple and there was a whole big thing. Make sure you check your candy. I think the whole ritual of Halloween is ridiculous. I had a couple people ring my doorbell yesterday. I, of course, didn't answer the fucking door. I didn't buy any candy anyway. But the whole, um, there was a whole big scare. Halloween, oh my God. You know, like one kid or something. It was either one or two. It was like the same guy, I think, and maybe a couple of kids uh, cut themselves or but whatever. You're not going to die from a razor blade in the apple, but you could like slice your tongue open. That would suck. Anyway, um... Or, I mean, people could inject fucking candy with shit anyway if they really wanted to. I mean, look how people don't look at the safety of America. You know, if you have a country where people are willing to go to strangers' doors and fucking get candy. And you could easily, like, inject fucking something that would kill you into candy and not even notice. Because you could have a thin-ass fucking needle. And, and, you know, how many problems are there really on Halloween of, of people getting hurt by candy, if any? So it's it's just so ridiculous that, yeah, they show the minority of things that happen, all the bad things and none of the good things. And it alters people's perception because they don't think of things like I said, like the amount of the population, for example, is what one of the things I went into. Or, you know, the percentage of how often this or how likely or the probability of something, they don't they don't look at that. They just see a story on TV and freak out. So you have if you look at 13 year olds now and also people's perceptions have even been altered about that. Like I said, my grandfather in World War II was 14 and, and went to war. And I, and I bet you if the people that knew that he was 14 later, maybe not the people in the military or whatever, because I think he would have gotten in trouble, but or that he was going, probably didn't even think it was a big fucking deal. Because he was a bit, you know, it was based on his size. I guess he was, you know, full grown. He had a beard already, whatever. Um, so they they didn't even look at that as a big fucking deal. But now you have a 14 year old going, you know, joining the army or something or to fight or whatever. They probably would look at it, uh, look at it as a big deal. So people said perception has been altered for the negative in many ways. Now, there's positive things, positive changes that have happened. Um, not a lot. I mean something like slavery where people were looked at as property. And now a lot of people would say they still are looked at that way. But um, 
because there's still racism and yes, there is still is racism, but essentially we're all slaves of the government. We're all giving, well, we're not all giving our, our money because some people don't pay any taxes legally because they're getting checks from the government. They're getting taxes instead of paying taxes. But, you know, you're having 25, I'm having 25% of my money stolen from the government without my consent. So, so people, you know, kids are more immature, I think, at those ages than they were. And I don't, I don't think that's a good thing. Now, it is what it is, and people have the right to raise their kids the way they want. However, at the same time, when you're talking about ownership of people, and if you believe you can do whatever you want to your kid, and because you feel that you own them, then that's fucked up. I mean, you don't own your kid. And... What is the point and the purpose of all of this shit? There was another thing that I saw of parents spying on their kids, you know, going through their diaries, going through their phones, seeing where they're going. Do they think that what they're going to somehow, how often is this going to happen? So you somehow save your kid from doing something that, they don't end up doing because you go through their shit. That's not going to happen. And I'll tell you why you may stop them for a night or a specific time, but you're not going to stop them in the long term because all you're going to do one is piss them off and they might be, you know, you don't know how that affects them later in life and damage is, them or whatever i don't know um because it does you know you feel like you can't trust people or whatever but they're gonna do what they're gonna do now you can be a parent who develops a relationship of trust and lets them do what they want to do, but be involved and advise them and tell them, well, I don't think this is a good idea. I don't think you should do this, but I'm not going to stop you because you're going to do what you're going to do. Or you can just try to stop them and lock them in their room and whatever. And then you have either they go and do it anyway, somehow they sneak out or they do it another time or they go crazy later and fuck up their life and do a bunch of crazy things or, you know, whatever. So there's, you know, it's almost similar to drugs in a way of the being illegal compared to being illegal and the positives of it just being legal. Even though, again, If there were no positives, I would still say it should be legal because of the self-ownership part. And I think as a teenager, once you, you hit, you know, your teenage years, um, and before then is a whole nother story, but we'll say for the purposes of, you know, just talking about teenagers to say that you don't own yourself by that point is unfair. I mean, you're fully developed. Most people are physically. Now I know they say, well, your brain's not fully developed and and men still can grow. Uh, So, you know, what I mean is, they're they've gone through puberty even though they can you know get taller or whatever until i think early 20s but most girls stop growing at like 14 the majority of them they grow stop growing pretty young and there's a reason for that and there's a reason why again you know girls are fertile (laughs) 
I think what fertility peaks at something in their in girls twenties. So again, I'm not saying I'm I'm more a proponent for having kids later, but there's reasons for all these things. And I'm not saying that 14 year olds should be having kids neither. I, I think teenagers that have kids are stupid, but I, I do believe that you have the right to go out if you want to and do pretty much what you want to do when you're a teenager and this fucking arbitrary law of 18. And then you have on uh, one of these shows, you know, the girl was 17 and her mother's yelling at her, telling her what she can do. And, you know, I don't know 17 and how many months, but she had to be at least 17 in one month. So what in 11 months though, it's totally different. I mean, it's ridiculous. And it doesn't do anything positive. Now, I'm not saying that people should just let, um, just not act like they don't care and be like, oh, just go do whatever you want to do. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that, you know, they have the right as a human being a fully grown human being to what is the harm. And really, if you look at it, I mean, there's this whole fear built up that, you know, what is the harm of them going out and, you know, oh, they might do drugs or, but they're going to do that if they're going to do that, or they might what have sex, which they're going to do if they're going to do. And uh, kids are are having sex. Kids, why, (laughs) again, why are, you know, if kids weren't, not kids, but if teenagers weren't meant to have sex, then why are they getting their periods? Why are they able to have kids? Why do teenage boys' hormones, you know, are out of control or whatever? You know, all of these things. But it's okay for the the mother to be a big whore and, you know, bring all these guys into the house, a single mother. And that's okay. But for her daughter to have a boyfriend and be in one relationship that she's, you know, a sexual relationship that maybe she's been in for a long time and say she's 15 and he's 17, then that's not okay. And then you have the statutory rape thing where, this is this is ridiculous. Um, I know in Nevada it's sixteen unless they changed it, but you know where an eighteen-year-old has sex with a sixteen-year-old, and all of a sudden it's it's statutory rape, or a fifteen-year-old, which is just insane. But what is the fear? And it's. Is it really fair like this one mother was saying, oh, it's because I love you guys and I don't want you to make the same mistakes? Well, one, weren't you parenting all these years? And what is spying and stopping kids from doing what they want to do? How is that better than developing a relationship based on trust based on they know they can tell you whatever they're doing because you're not going to punish them or ground them or whatever. And and then people try to do that. Well, we're going to stop our kids doing something from punishing them. None of that shit is going to stop anything. That's the whole point. That's, that's my comparison or analogy to drugs. It's like people that do drugs are going to do drugs. You're not going to stop them, whether it's legal or illegal. The majority, I'd say about 99%. You may have a 1% or 2% that like, well, if it's illegal, maybe I'll try it or something once. But it's a very small amount. Most people are not going to, if drugs become legal, say, oh, drugs are illegal. I'm going to go do them now. No. Why does the U.S. have the biggest problem 
with alcohol than I think any other country, at least compared to Europe, because Europe doesn't make a big deal about it. And that's the whole thing. You, by trying to stop your kids, you drive them to want to do these things. And again, I'm not saying not being an active parent. That's the whole point is being an active parent. And I think being more so active than if you um, than when you try to stop them from doing things. Because you want to talk to them about all this stuff and give them your opinion and give them your experiences and then let them make their own fucking decisions based on, you know, being able to talk to them. Because how can you have a relationship with your kid if you're snooping on them or you're grounding them or you're not letting them date or go out or do anything? And how can they have a, a, a happy, you know, teenage years and be able to enjoy those. And, you know, the majority of people get through their teenage years fine. That's another thing. The fallacy that they don't. Because everybody that's alive today was once a teenager. So, it, it really is... I think making things worse. Now, not only that, again, is the fact that you don't own your kids. They own themselves. It's their body. I think I would say that there shouldn't be an age of consent. And I know saying that people right away, oh my God. Now, I don't know. And and I'm just saying that because I don't believe in government and laws and things like that. But that doesn't mean I think that, you know, young kids should be having sex, but I don't have any problem with teenagers having sex with other teenagers. Um, I don't know how you, and that's why I, I said, you know, just talking about teenagers, because when it comes to younger kids, that's a whole nother thing. And that's, that's the whole issue there is, how do you deal with that aspect of it? You know, the letting kids go out and hang out with their friends and go outside and play, you know, when you're talking about younger kids and not giving them a bedtime. I mean, that's not things that are a big deal. But when it comes to, uh, you know, you the thing you worry about is, of course, the fucking sexual predators and whatever and and the people that get molested but that's another thing that you know how many people has that it's i don't know it it, it they make it sound like there's a huge amount of people that have been um sexually molested and that i that's something where i'd have to look at the statistics and of course those aren't accurate because there's plenty of people that have never said anything but that's what you worry about with that but i want to go back to focusing on um, teenagers before we end the show but um when it comes down to it how can they not feel and, and i've talked to people about this and i felt like this Not feel like you're trapped, like you don't have any rights, like you don't have any freedoms. If you not only have, like I said, your school, the police, your parents should be the ones that at least are there for you, not just in that sense, but, you know, Parents are teaching kids or bringing up kids to be obedient and not question things and not because you're just you just follow orders. You know, your parents tell you do this, do that. You watch TV shows. They ask for can I dad? Can I do this? Can I do that? Can I? It's it's fucking it's kind of sickening in a way like you're asking to do everything like they're. 
you know, fine. If if little kids, whatever, that's a different story. But you're talking about teenagers that are asking to do whatever to go out and and oh well, I want to call from the parents. I want to know what's going on there. I want to know what are you going to do about it? Like seriously. And and if if you actually trusted, you know, or were a parent prior to them becoming a teenager, one, why would you have to worry? Because I would think you, you'd have built a relationship of trust and that they would tell you these things and you wouldn't need to uh, limit or try to limit, you know, what they do. Um, now, if they're, you know, if they start getting arrested and stuff like, well, that that's a whole nother thing, too, because you look at kids are getting arrested for ridiculous things. I mean, kids are getting arrested for sexting um, other, you know, some girl got arrested for having a picture of herself, a naked picture she took of herself on her phone. Um, they're getting arrested for walking to the park um, if they're too young. So even even that, if they're doing bad things, and the only thing I I look at as bad is I, I treat, look at teens the same way, I think, that I would look at adults in the, as long as they're not killing somebody or assaulting or stealing property or, you know, if they're doing things like that, well, if they're killing somebody, you know, you're not really going to be able to do much. But if they're getting arrested for just randomly beating people or breaking in and stealing shit or doing, you know, robberies and stuff like that, okay, then that's a whole nother story. But assuming that they're not doing that, and I know people say that, or at least some people say that what your kid does doesn't reflect on you and people are worried about. Now, I don't think you should worry about it as far as who gives a fuck what people think, but I think that it does reflect on you in a sense. Um, because I think that what you've done to that point as far as raising them or what they seen, because not always, because things can happen when you're not there. And I understand that. And I understand that parents, you know, a lot of them, their hearts in the right place, but their mind is not. And that the things that they do, they feel like they're doing the right thing. Um, because, you know, certain things can happen, but that's more, you know, that's where I would be not restrictive to when I have a younger kid, but, um, I probably would worry about shit like that. So like, I wouldn't have when the kid is still around an age where they're not old enough to be alone, you know, I'd be very careful if I left them with somebody or something like that, or, you know, things like that, because I would be, that's the last thing I, I, you know, you hear about this stuff and that's what happens. You hear about this stuff and you think that, you know, half the population, you got to worry about molesting your kids, um, which isn't, <laughs> the reality see even something like that has you know even some of these things get to me to an extent so uh, i i i don't know um basically that's that's all the time we have uh left and i i even went over and i, I wish i was more uh prepared for tonight but it's just uh I feel bad for teenagers because I remember what I went through and, and with me, it was different in that, you know, I wasn't really restricted on where I could go and what I could do and things like that. It was, 
my father would use things against me, like you can't use my car or you can't whatever. And that's how I felt like I was in a, you know, I felt like I was in a prison or whatever because the way he would act towards me and, and treat me with thing and hold things over my head. And basically if I didn't have a car, it's like, how the fuck am I going to get anywhere to do anything anyway? Um, but it he was never really restrictive on I didn't get grounded and that I couldn't go places and things like that. It was more like just being an asshole to be an asshole type thing. Um, and that's a whole nother story. So I, I just understand. And I know a lot of kids who had it worse than me and I've seen that too. And I've talked to kids about it as well and, and how, they were damaged by, you know, not having any privacy, not being able to have a life as a teenager um, and enjoy that time um, because they're their parents trying to stop, you know, basically everything that they did. So and I think it's getting worse because of government media and government itself, really, because they're they're the ones I think that control all that. And government schools, police and schools, police in general, and no one gives a shit. That that's the main thing that kids that are t- teenagers care. And then, as I said, as they get older, you know, once they turn like twenty one, they don't give a fuck anymore. You know, they don't really think back. So there's nobody really fighting for the rights of of teenagers who I think when it comes to a control standpoint, you know, they have so many different levels of control. And for me, that was just a frustrating thing. And the discipline to just be disciplined, like I started talking about the hat thing and and. That I ended up going home over and I got detention because I wouldn't take off my hat because I'm like, why? There's no reason. There's no valid reason to not wear my hat. And we didn't have a gang issue neither. So it had nothing to do with that. And that's stupid anyway. But it was nothing to do with that. It was a respect thing. It's, well, you can't wear your hat indoors because of respect. And everything's about respect and old tradition. And that's why I reject ridiculous traditions as well because of things like that. But anyway, again, that's all the time we have for tonight. Um, We will be back uh, hopefully tomorrow, but I am not 100% sure. But Either way, we will be playing something because we are on 24-7. So you can tune in at any time on the live stream from Spreaker or the Nonpartisan Liberty for All website, nonpartisanlibertyforall.com. I appreciate everybody for tuning in tonight and any night you tune in. And, of course, if you go to the website, there is a donate button. Uh, I rarely mention it because nobody ever donates. But if you'd like to donate to the show, you can always donate because we're 100% uh, self-funded by me (laughs) and my job. And I haven't made any money yet. Not that that's my goal. But, you know, hey, it would be nice to make a little money. But that's fine. So, Uh, Thanks again, everybody, and have a good night. We will defend these police officers. Listen to Police Officers Command.